it's impossible to avoid them. For decades, we've been surrounded by sweet and fatty foods, and the body has not been dealing well with these eating habits. But what about the brain? Do our mental health, our moods, and our brain abilities suffer from the wrong kind of nutrition? We know that junk food is making us fat, but science is telling us now that it might also be shrinking our brains. Habitual intake of foods high in fat and sugar result in a reprogramming of the brain. Brain researchers have joined the dining table to study the effects of our eating habits. Microscope, micro manipulator, and ultra sensitive recorder. Xavier Fioramenti is at the helm of an apparatus that can record the electrical activity of a single neuron. The principle is simple a slice of mouse brain is immersed in a liquid that keeps it alive. The researcher approaches it carefully with an electrode. It's a meticulous operation. Here, I go down the pipette in the slice of brain. And now we will approach this recording pipette near the neuron to make contact. That's it, we made contact. And now we will be able to measure the electrical activity of the neuron. The upward peaks that we see are potential areas for action. This is how neurons encode information. The time that elapses between the peaks is the message sent by the neuron. Now we will increase the glucose concentration in the bath, and we will see if this cell responds to this increase in concentration of glucose. As it can be seen here, this cell responds to the increase with more electrical activity. There is more potential for action than what could be seen here before the increase in glucose concentration. This signal comes from a single cell. But in the brain, the neurons are all connected to each other. That makes the scientists suspect that glucose has the ability to modify the activity of entire brain areas that control emotions and pleasure. Is this how sugar ensures its grip on our will? This is, for the moment, only a hypothesis. But today, sugar addiction is the subject of intense research in laboratories. And what appears more and more clear is that the power of sugar is similar to that of a drug. Serge Ahmed is one of the first to provide proof with a very simple experiment. Step one, he raised rats, giving them cocaine and sugar. Then, after weeks of this diet, he presented the animals with a choice. We have the situation in which the animal has the choice between a lever that is connected to a syringe that contains a drug solution, and the drug in question is a hard drug like cocaine and heroin, and on the left, a lever allows him to control a syringe that contains a sweet drink. And there we see the animal chooses to take the sweet drink. The rats selected the sugar water four times more often than the drugs. It can't be called a glucose overdose, but the irrepressible desire is plain to see. So this experiment simply shows that sugar has more addictive potential than we had imagined, and it is perhaps even stronger than the pull of hard drugs, such as cocaine and heroin. Today, we live in a food environment that's a little crazy. 
We find sugar in a lot of foods, as we would expect, in sugary drinks. But we also find sugar in foods that are not meant to be sweet, such as ham or soup. We could cite other examples, but it's adding sugar to these foods that contributes to the fact that we make people addicted to it without them knowing it. Here at the Oregon Research Institute, the influence of sweet food on the human brain is being investigated. What this program of research has uh, revealed is that habitual consumption of energy-dense food alters your neural circuitry in exactly the same way of consumption of drugs of abuse. Eric Stice recruited about 100 students half of whom regularly eat ice cream, while the others never eat it. They all came to the laboratory to drink a milkshake inside an MRI device and give the researchers a peek into their brain activity. Great, Casey. So what we're going to do today is give you chocolate milkshake and um, record the brain activity uh, in your entire brain as you receive and anticipate receiving chocolate milkshake to look at the neural basis of consuming uh, energy-dense foods. The test subjects can sip the milkshake through the tubes without moving their heads. What we found out is that the people who never eat ice cream, you could trace the reward circuitry. Everything lit up just beautifully, and it activated things uh, very strongly. But in contrast, the people who ate ice cream every day showed a very diminished response. There was hardly any activation whatsoever, uh, illustrating that regular intake of energy-dense foods really reduces the pleasure you experience when you consume those foods. The reward circuit is a region of the brain that controls the feeling of pleasure. It is particularly responsive to sugar consumption. But eating too much ends up weakening its responsiveness, so that at the same dose, the sensations of pleasure are ultimately reduced. And Eric Stice's experiment reveals another more subtle, perhaps more pernicious effect. After a diet too rich in sugar, the brain becomes hypersensitive to images of food. The more and more you eat ice cream, the less and less the reward circuitry is recruited when you consume ice cream, but the more your reward circuitry is, is activated when you see cues that say you might get ice cream. So your, your reward circuitry fires up when you see an ice cream store as you're driving down the street or you see a commercial for ice cream on the television, and the reward circuitry activates much more for people who eat ice cream all the time than it does for people who don't. And that prompts eating in the absence of hunger that drives obesity and weight gain. This direct influence of food on our brain plays a crucial role in what we choose to eat each day. 